All right, welcome everybody. I'm just, yeah, so I've got a bunch of things to say uh, about the current state of the world, uh, the more beautiful world. And um, basically, there are a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of uh, intense passions right now in the public sphere. So I was just thinking about um, you know people are, have been writing me asking for my take on things, and and uh, sometimes with a lot of maybe uh, hysterical fear. And I was remembering a time, this was about, uh, gosh, it must've been like 14 years ago or something, when maybe 13 years ago, Jimmy, our eldest son was a teenager and he was planning some kind of, something that didn't seem like a very good idea to me, uh, involving his friends and I don't know, drugs or whatever. It just seemed like, you know, a bad idea. And I expressed some concern. And Jimmy said, Dad, chill out. It'll be fine, he said. And <laughs> I think, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, I, I still was a little bit worried, but everything ended up fine. And, um, you know, I managed to chillax about it. So I think that right now, a lot of people need to chillax because there are these timelines that people are uh, tapping into. They are, um, they are real places where these timelines lead to these futures of civil unrest, maybe even civil war, totalitarian crackdown, like all kinds of terrible things. And if, for example, um, Naomi Wolf, I overheard Stella listening to a Naomi Wolf broadcast. For those who don't know, she was a uh, she was in the Clinton White House, I think. She was um, maybe the Obama White House as well. She was a, a Democratic operative, and then she's kind of gone rogue and become a, a critic of the system. Uh, and she is predicting. She's saying that. Uh, there is a conscious agenda uh, to, in the wake of the election, to create civil unrest, uh, to be followed by a massive crackdown and a consolidation of totalitarian powers um, in the uh, corporate, military, intelligence, uh, democratic um, party uh, complex. Um, and you know she she brings forth various indications that this is, this is happening, that this is being planned, and and it paints the world in very alarming colors, and invites us to panic. And in that worldview, panic is a good thing because you got to get prepared. Uh, another example of what I'm talking about is the, we came up in our last call. Uh, the um, some of some of what's being said about the um, post hurricane response in North Carolina. Uh, a friend just reached out with concern about her son, who's gotten deep into some of these theories about what's really happening there, and talking about bulldozed bodies, you know, and the whole thing being planned through weather control technologies for a land grab. Uh, and we, 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 we talked about this in our last call. Um, so I don't know, some of you might know exactly what I'm talking about, but it's, and, and it's, but it's not only on the anti-authoritarian right, it's also on the uh, establishment left where the threat is Trump He's going to get elected. He's going to round up political opponents and send them to prison. He's going to take over government. He's going to fire the government and replace it with his own people. He's going to ban abortion. He's going to, you know, basically institute a fascist takeover of this country and and establish a white Christian nationalist dictatorship. 
Uh, so so it, that um, that state, that psychological, emotional state, is identical to the uh, right wing counterpart of it's the George Soros backed uh, power elite, you know, and the Davos crowd, the World Economic Foundation, Economic Forum, and and the the uh, global human trafficking elite who are finally perfecting their plans uh, to take over every aspect of life and control all human behavior through central bank digital currencies and ubiquitous surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. And this is this election is the last chance to stop them. Both sides are saying kind of the same thing. And both are predicting and preparing for um, a breakdown of social order and essentially civil war, and they're already kind of in a war mindset. And what I want to say is that that mindset can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. It leaves out important stabilizing forces, the forces of inertia, the forces of no matter what happens, people still get up and they go to their job uh, because they don't know what else to do. Um, the, the forces of supply chain agreements and contracts that, uh, you know, span over months and years, um, the inertia of institutions. There's an awful lot of, of um, that, well, that's one level of stabilizing influences. And then there are the, um, there's the, the morphic field of restraint, uh, forbearance, patience, uh, the kind of maturity that people demonstrate every day, you know, like in the airport, you know, there I was standing in line and there was an obnoxious customer in front of me uh, trying to get his, you know, an extra carry on bag. And he's like, well, I'm a million mile traveler, you know, and, you know, it's just kind of, uh, coercing and, and, and almost abusing the, uh, the, the, um, you know, airline personnel and, uh, she would have none of it, you know, and sent him, send him back. And, um, but, you know, she stayed polite. She stayed strong. She stayed patient. And when I got to the front, I'm like, Hey, thank you for holding the line there, you know, and being courteous and like that kind of thing that, um, it exerts an influence on the world in ways that are hard to see. It is it establishes a kind of a normalcy uh, and a kind of a standard uh, that uh, affects the behavior of the rich and powerful, the behavior of the elites, the behavior of those at the helm of these powerful institutions, it affects them both because that's the, the, that's the cultural matrix that they're in, that's the example that they see, but also on um, a more mysterious level through the creation of a morphic field. So all of these things, basically what I want, what I want to say is that these apocalyptic scenarios, these uh, of, of extreme turmoil uh, and the the collapse of life as we know it these when you get these are not these are by no means inevitable when you go down one of these rabbit holes then they seem inevitable because as you enter that that perspective as you enter that worldview and as you enter the psychological state of being that is associated with it the evidence for that begins to accumulate around you you, you, everything uh, looks like, um, you know, confirms everything that you that you bring into your field confirms your suspicion, uh, your fear about what's going to happen. So the biggest danger, actually, it's kind of a paradox. Um, the biggest. The, the, the greatest force that's pushing us forward 
a scenario of civil strife is the belief that we are headed toward a time of civil strife. It is the way of seeing that collapses complexity into a simple us versus them narrative. And you hear me speaking about this all the time, and I just keep doing it because it's so important and so insidious. The, way, the, the, the invitation to understand the world uh, according to perpetrators and victims, good guys and bad guys. This is the training we get from watching Hollywood movies. You know, at the beginning of the movie, you're not really sure who the bad guy is. I'm thinking of Iron Man, which I saw one time <laughs> against my better judgment, you know, and there's like the CEO of Iron Man's company or whatever his name is, Stark, somebody Stark, his name anyway, the CEO of his company is this bald guy. And at the beginning, he doesn't, you can't tell he's the bad guy. But there's a few little hints, and then at some point you realize, oh, man, he's the bad guy. I hope Iron Man figures that out soon. And that's how you understand the movie. Once, you've under, once you can identify who the bad guy is, you understand the movie. It all makes sense now. So that programming runs very deep. It's in, it, it, it conditions us to look at the world that way. Once we look at the world that way, we become vulnerable to manipulation. Because all that a uh, authority has to do to control you is to point the finger at whatever bad guy is convenient. So we see this across the political spectrum. You know, the, 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 the immigrants, that was another thing that Naomi Wolf was going on about, uh, like all these immigrants, young men, you know, with, with these identical backpacks. Obviously, this is a coordinated invasion. Uh, and they're going to be mobilized post-election to, to, you know, as modern day brown shirts to, uh, you know, riot in the streets and burn things. And they'll, that will that require a, an authoritarian crackdown. Like it's all planned out. And how do you know that? Because they have, you know, identical backpacks. Uh, they must have been issued from somewhere, right? I mean, it could also be that, like, these are really good, good backpacks and people who are on uh, uh, an arduous, uncertain journey, uh, you know, they, hey, where'd you get that backpack? You know, I mean, it could be, I mean, who knows why, but but it, it's one of those pieces of evidence that locks into the, the puzzle. So, okay, so the bad guys, the, the, it's the immigrants, that it, there's, there's, a, there's a comfort in explaining the world in that way, even if you can't do anything about it. There's a kind of a comfort in conspiracy theories. And, and I'm, I'm speaking of, of the big, the capital C conspiracy theory, that all of the bad things happening in the world are the fault of a cabal of uh, diabolical manipulators. There's a comfort in that. There's also despair in that, because if they're so powerful, so powerful that they can control everything, even the weather, that everything is orchestrated, then there's no hope. There's no hope to ever do anything about it if they're that powerful. So there's despair there, but there's also a kind of a comfort because you're not staring into the unknown anymore. You're not staring into the, the mysterious. You understand everything. You have the answer for everything. And however impossible it is, you also have the solution for everything. And programmed by uh, Hollywood movies, you have a kind of a false hope. The false hope being that the good guys are going to swoop in and destroy the evil villains. That is that explains a lot of the appeal of um, you know the QAnon stuff. I don't know if, how many of you ever looked into that at all, but they, they always dangle the promise of the good guys, the commandos, they're going to go in and arrest all of the pedophilia elite, you know, or whatever, wh whatever the bad guy is. So there's, so that's another aspect of comfort. The world makes sense again. To really step into the unknown, 
is disorienting. To recognize the power of such things as I mentioned, you know, institutional inertia, incompetence, foolishness, petty squabbling and infighting among the elites, uh, opportunism, uh, plain old chaos. Um, this complex picture makes it hard to really make sense of things. But it also allows for a genuine hope. Because if there's no one driving the bus, then maybe we can influence the direction that the bus is taking. What we have to sacrifice, though, is knowing. What we have to sacrifice is a certain a certainty about what's going to happen, um, how the world is. And we maybe have to undo some of the programming that sees the world in terms of good and evil, the good guys and the bad guys. I was having a conversation this morning where, where I connected the, the same mindset um, with um, environmental activism, where once you identify uh, carbon dioxide as the bad guy, then everything becomes very simple. You can, in fact, reduce it to mathematics. If an energy technology produces carbon, or methane, you know, greenhouse gases, then it's bad. And if it doesn't, then it's good. So in that case, you know, oil and gas are bad and, uh, you know, electric vehicles and that kind of stuff, that's good. But what happens, well, anytime you collapse the complex into the simple, then you're not seeing something. You're not seeing all the things that were collapsed. So what you're not seeing when it comes to the environmental uh, collapse of which mirrors an actual environmental collapse, uh, but but the conceptual collapse of a living being called an ecosystem into uh, a uh, you know contraption uh, whose health can be measured by. Um, the distribution of gases, you leave out all that makes it alive. And so the, the consequences are, are even worse environmental damage than oil and gas are causing. And so, you know, the, the lithium mines, the cobalt mines, the silver mines, the, the rare earth mineral mines, um, the, the hydroelectric dams, all of these things are, are celebrated for reducing carbon emissions, but they're causing massive, massive ecological destruction. A friend of mine is um, on a uh, trip to uh, northern Saskatchewan, uh, where there's a really big, I think more than one, but there's, he was talking about one big hydroelectric project that the uh, indigenous people are trying to to get the dam removed. Because what happened, the dam was maybe built, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, uh, but the, the damage takes unfolds over time. And basically it's dried out uh, thousands of, of square kilometers of wetlands, which are the, and, and those wetlands are the nesting grounds for all kinds of waterfall, waterfowl, geese, ducks, swans, and they're just all drying out because of that dam and destroying the native ways of life there too. So, you know, it, it's ironic that it is so-called environmentalists who have historically championed these dams because they produce so-called clean energy. 
and it's not that you know they're they've been deputized by the World Economic Forum to to you know do evil in the world. It's because they are programmed by a good or bad mentality that then conditions them to to accept without looking much more deeply, oh, this is good energy, this is green energy. You know, green becomes good and what green is, is something very simple. And it's convenient that way. So this is just, you know, I could name other examples of the consequences of this kind of thinking. It makes the public vulnerable to getting, you know, maneuvered into wars. Because again, the leaders just have to point at the bad guys, uh, you know, terrorists or, or Russians or something like that. And then you know what to do. You know what the plot is. And the promise is that our problems will be solved if we, just like in the movies, our problems will be solved if we overcome the bad guys. If we build a wall to keep out the immigrants, if we, you know, regime change Russia, if we, you know, uh, contain China, like all of these things, if we bomb Iran and destroy their nuclear program, uh, you know, once you've identified something as the, the as evil, as the, once you've scapegoated it, once you've made it the source of the problem, then all kinds of horrors unfold from there. And anybody who criticizes that, they're on the side of evil. And anybody who promotes a narrative that holds the designated evil ones as anything else than evil, then you are aiding and abetting evil too. So it lends itself to a kind of totalitarianism, to censorship, to maintaining the... Uh, uh, Saitha calls it, calls it the cognitive infrastructure. Saitha is like a Homeland Security Department that, that um, you know, tries to protect America now from, I mean, their main functions are, are censorship and um, um, propaganda, basically. And so the cognitive infrastructure are the conversations that we have, the ideas, things that we publish, you know, it's the internet. And... Uh, you know, once you accept this idea of a cognitive infrastructure, the the um, infrastructure of ideas, then the and if you and and to you know if you're going to protect it against bad influences, then you know you have an Orwellian state. So, this is the, I'm, I'm making kind of a long loop here, but to loop it back to our current time. Um, you know, there are there are conspiracies, there are nefarious actors, there are ruthless and opportunistic people who who have unscrupulous, illegal, unethical plans to lie, to cheat, to steal. I'm not denying that those exist. But what I'm saying is to beware the programming to see that everywhere and to make that the default explanation for everything that's happening. Because, you know, once you actually meet some of these people, some of them are, are you know, really horrible people. <laughs> but generally speaking, most of them are totally decent, normal people doing exactly what you would do if you were in their job, subject to all kinds of pressures. Sometimes even wishing that they could do other than what they're doing. This happens a lot. People get imprisoned by the organizations that they founded. And they feel like they, you know, can't change the direction of the organization, especially if they didn't found it, if they're just the CEO or the president, you know. 
sometimes everybody in an organization disagrees with what the organization is doing, yet nobody's capable of making the change, not even altogether, because it's taking on a life of its own. So this is, now let me just shift gears here, um, you know, because we are coming up on an election and there are a lot of strong feelings, a lot of doomsday predictions, you know, a lot of people saying that democracy hangs in the balance on both sides saying that. And I will acknowledge that our political culture is um, quite sick. It's not healthy. And it's been getting less and less healthy over my lifetime. But we do not have to accept this inevitable deterioration. And we have to recognize that these predictions of total breakdown are themselves a kind of a programming. They, they have, these are, you know, the concept of timelines, where there are, are multiple futures, and maybe we're on one timeline, but some people are tapping into another timeline. And when you're occupying that timeline, it seems very real, it seems inevitable. And anybody who doesn't see it must be blind. And sometimes events from that alternate timeline penetrate into our own timeline. And those who are paying attention to those events take that as confirmation that we are indeed on that timeline because they are predisposed to see that and not the things that are not from that timeline. So they'll see the, you know, incompetence and uh, of FEMA in responding to the hurricane, but they won't see the dedicated FEMA employees who are doing a great job. Do you even know that they exist? If you're really immersed in the counter narrative, you don't even know that they exist, but they do but you won't see them from that place. And here again, it's not so simple. You know, FEMA is not one thing. It is many, many people and many relationships doing some dumb things and some, some creative things, some good things and some bad things. And isn't it, isn't it, Tempting to just make it into one thing, you know, either good or bad. And so, because it has many aspects, just like you and I do, it lends itself to any one of these timelines. And you see this in personal relationships too, you know, like people do this all the time to each other. They're, they, they, will uh, look at a personal conflict that two people are having or that they're in a group and maybe originally you were friends with both of the, the, the fighting couple and now they're starting to, uh, they're starting to, to split up, you know, and they're trying to uh, align their friends, uh, get allies among their friends. And so they start telling you about the awful things that the other one did. And, and they're asking you to, to align with their story in which they're the good guy and the other person's the bad guy. And once you step into that story, you see all the terrible things that the other one did. So this, is, this invitation is constant. None of us, just like an organization isn't one thing, we are not one thing either as individuals. In one person's life, we might be an angel. In another person's life, 
in their intersection with us who might be a devil. So as we approach, what I can definitely say about the coming months is that the invitation into civil war will be strong. The invitation into the organization of the world into the good people and the bad people will be strong. The invitation to outrage will be strong because both sides will be presenting data points, incidents, events designed or chosen in order to provoke our, our outrage. Designed in order to demonstrate how horrible the other side is. So this will be a strong invitation. That's for sure. And if we accept that invitation as a society, then it will become true. And we will have civil war in one form or another. It may not be armed conflict, but, but once you have that in place, then as I said, totalitarian powers have an easy time because they can unify everybody in the hatred and rejection of something, of an other. You need an other to create the us, the unified us of fascism. So the best way that we can influence the coming times is to refuse that invitation and instead to be in a place of unity, the place of acknowledging, recognizing complexity, of knowing that no organization and no person is all good or all bad, even though maybe there are some who are dangerous, ruthless, opportunistic, but to hold the knowing that most people have a lot of good in them and that most people want to do the right thing, that most people want to contribute to life, want to serve each other, to know that that is why we are here to hold that, the knowledge that human beings are here to serve life, to serve life and beauty on earth. And it doesn't matter which side they're on. That's what they're really here for. And therefore, they are capable of exercising restraint they are capable of letting go when they didn't get what they want. Like the guy in the airplane boarding line. He was upset, but he didn't, you know, he didn't escalate. He grumbled a little bit, went and checked his bag. That can happen on, on the macro level too. It has been happening. You know, we've been teetering at the brink of, of a massive conflagration in the Middle East for months now, and it hasn't happened. Same thing with Ukraine and Russia. It hasn't happened. And we can be teetering on the brink of post-election chaos in this country but it doesn't have to happen either. And the, the forces that prevent that from happening, we can contribute to those. So that's why I'm, I'm advocating uh, what Jimmy told me, uh, that we just need to chillax a little bit. And just really be skeptical of those hysterical narratives, those, those alarmist, panicked narratives, you know, like that kind of feel good in a way. There's, there's almost a kind of an escapism in it, you know, it would be kind of a relief 
if things blow up, then we get a reprieve. A reprieve from not knowing what to do, a reprieve from the confusion and the, and the complexity. You know, there's a, there's a simplicity to war. Moral choices become clear. Because here's good and here's bad. It makes choices simple. If everything's divided into good and bad, then you always know what to do. Those of us who have been seasoned by life enough to know that you can't always tell what's good and bad are then able to hold center in these coming times. And when, when, when we encounter these simplifying us versus them narratives, we can um, defuse them. We can say, hold on a second. I see what you're saying, but also this. We can bring calmness into these situations, into public dialogues, into comments, threads, into conversations. This is a kind of peace consciousness, this calmness. It's not avoidance. It's fidelity to the possibility of peace. It's fidelity to the complex view of the human being and to, to stay centered in the storm, in the storm of unknowing, to be okay with mystery and chaos and unpredictability. And I think that Okay, and I just want to pause here. I just saw a comment come up. What is the evidence? And then I can only read the first sentence of it, first line of it. So I don't know what the comment said, but it provoked something in me. Um, what is the evidence that so so yeah. You know, the evidence is convincing to those who immerse themselves in it. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of maps, you know, and plots of where where various, you know, uh, radar installations are and theories about how the 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 um, the electromagnetic uh, properties of the of the radar installations, of, you know, interact with the charged particles of storm systems, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's a whole whole big rabbit hole. OK, and and. You know, I am not that convinced. You know, even when I enter that rabbit hole, I'm like, hold on, this is like a highly nonlinear chaotic system. I mean, really, is it, is it that controllable? But, you know, what do I know? Um, for present purposes, what's important is that those who immerse themselves in it find it very convincing. So, but where I want to go here. The reason that, that the word evidence um, provoked me is that this calm center does not need evidence that peace is possible. It carries a it carries an energy with it everywhere it goes and makes peace become possible. All of us have met people like that who carry peace with them. This is the kind of capacity that it's time to really um, access, to really bring online. Because it's what's needed now. Because as I said, there are a lot of invitations to hate, a lot of invitations to othering, a lot of invitations to war. 
wars of words, and maybe it'll become more than just wars of words. Hate comes from a simplifying narrative, from the collapse of a complex, complex person into something simple, into a caricature. So, yeah, so what, what I would like to, to do now is just to, to maybe, maybe we can uh, do a short meditation together. So, yeah, I'm going to close my eyes. I invite you to close your eyes, too. And amid, amid all of these invitations to hate and the swirling programs of explaining things and all the evidence, you'll notice a still point. The zone of calm, of peace. So take a little time to settle into that, into that still point, into that calm zone. And you might find yourself sometimes going into the stormy zone. But even when you do, you'll, you'll, you're still aware of the peace inside of it. to return to. This is the piece that you carry that is its own proof, its own evidence. It doesn't need evidence that peace is possible because it is peace. And now you notice another thing about it. Notice that it is suffused with a kind of goodwill. A 
it's not just calm, it's also friendly. Generous, loving. So in a minute, I'm going to ask you to uh, open your eyes and on Zoom, go to gallery view. Just don't do it yet, but I'm just going to explain what you'll do. You go to gallery view. And from this place of peace, suffused with love and goodwill, just pick out one of the faces. and project that goodwill. Find, here, let's do it right now. So open your eyes and go to gallery view and find a face. And because this peace consciousness is strong in us now, because we're all in it together, You pick a face and you'll find that yourself almost overflowing with the desire that this person be blessed, that this person be fortunate. And you'll find an appreciation for the silent struggles of that person. The invisible heroism behind that face, a whole life's journey. A soul made flesh. This is the truth that we are in together right now. And we stand in it together and stabilize it. So that we can carry it forth to where it's needed. And look at another face. Every politician, every 
commenter on a thread on Twitter is one of these people, is a face, is a person, a journey, <laughs> except for the AI bots. Even when people are expressing hate, that's not all they are. And are we now strong enough to refuse the invitation that hateful expressions bring the hate in return, to write that person off, to collapse them into something simple? This is the strength we need to build for coming times. To stay in this truth. This is faith. We refuse invitations into untruth. Any collapse of a full human being into a caricature is a lie. Any collapse of the complex into the simple is a lie. It leaves something out. So I want to thank you for joining me in this truth and building this field together. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say that the meditation is over. It's something to return to, even in just like a little, little 10 seconds. <laughs>